Yes. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for coming to this program. Uh, what we're here to talk about is wrongful convictions. And it's really important that you understand what we mean when we say that. Especially for you as students, you've come in age at a time where we've had some of the most important conversations about criminal justice in American history. And we can debate things about punishment and police practices, but regardless of what you think about anything else in the world, you all share a fundamental belief that innocent people should not be in prison. When we talk about the wrongfully convicted, we're not talking about technical issues that allow a guilty person to go free. We talk about people who are factually and morally innocent of crimes. Some of the most horrific crimes that you could commit, homicides and sexual assaults, who despite their innocence are found guilty and imprisoned. And this is an important thing to understand no matter where you are in the world. But keep in mind that here in Ohio, we are in a death penalty state. And innocent people get executed anywhere that there's capital punishment. So even if you believe in capital punishment, you have to understand that we run the risk of executing innocent people. Ohio is at the forefront there in a way I wish we weren't. Nationally, between 2 and 5% of people on death row are proven innocent. We know that from cases in which it's been demonstrated, including DNA cases. And disproportionately, the death penalty impacts people of color, particularly African American and black communities. For every four people, for every five people in Ohio that we've executed, we've ended up exonerating one. There have been 11 documented exonerations in Ohio from our death row, a death row that has at most 150 people. So you can tell that 2 to 5 percent is just an average. In Ohio, it's higher. And whenever you hear numbers or statistics, it's critical that you don't just think of them as numbers or statistics. Those numbers and statistics represent human life. The reality is that we don't know how many people have been wrongfully convicted or how many will be wrongfully convicted during the course of any given year. What we do know is that since 1989, there have been 3,000 388 documented exonerations in the United States. Those people collectively lost 29,000 years to imprisonment for crimes they didn't commit. And today you're going to hear firsthand from one of those people. Keep in mind that every one of those people has a family and loved ones. And we talk a lot about wrongful conviction in relation to the person who's been imprisoned. But one of the things that we know inside of OIP is that when we convict an innocent person, we're also convicting their families. Think of anybody that you love and what it would be like for you to know that despite their innocence, they're in prison. And keep in mind, this is Ohio. When you go to prison, you're not going to some country club prison. You're not going to make ponchos with Martha Stewart or be in a warmer location like the Varsity Blues. What you're going to see is some of the worst prisons in the country. Hollywood comes to Ohio to film horror movies in our prisons. Every time I drive north on 71 and see what was the old Mansfield Reformatory, and there's an advertisement to come visit it at Halloween, it turns my stomach. That's where um, 
not only Hollywood has come, but when we have devalued human life and what happens in places like that as a tourist opportunity, we really have a long way to go in terms of these conversations. And that's why it's so important to everybody at the Ohio Innocence Project, but especially to our clients and their families, that folks like you show up at a Thursday morning at 9.30 event after what I'm sure has been a long week already. So we're going to get started with the program, but one of the things I um, want to show you is how the Ohio Innocence Project works. And what's critical to our work isn't just the lawyers, it's the clients and students just like you who work in chapters like OIPU. And as you may have noticed, there's a lot of women stepping up to be leaders in this field. So if you're male, you can join too, and there's always more room for women, but I want to make sure that you recognize how much women are doing uh, to help educate and increase awareness about all of this very important work. And what you'll see in the video are the students that help us, as well as firsthand you'll hear the words of some of our clients speaking directly to you. And that's the most important thing that you take away today. It's not so much what I have to say, it's what our clients have to say. And you'll have an opportunity um, as this program goes on to ask questions of our very honored guests today. So this video will be about 13 minutes long, and as soon as it's over, we're going to get to the program. I served 23 years for a wrongful conviction. I served 12 and a half years for a crime I did not commit. I spent 39 years of my life in prison for a crime I didn't commit. Well, a Cleveland man will soon be free from prison 39 years after he was falsely accused of murder. I can endure the beatings, the bites, the stabbings, but the loneliness <laughs> and the not knowing and you got so many questions but nobody's answering any of them. I spent 15 years incarcerated for a crime that I did not commit. Well, the rain Head Start school bus driver accused 20 years ago was back in a courtroom today. I thought my God, what am I going to do? How did this happen to me? You feel so in despair. You want to have that hope and you want to have that faith, but you don't know where you're going to get it from. I served 20 years in prison for crimes I didn't commit. I didn't do it. I did not do it. I'm not the guy. You're doing this time in prison. You're trying to scream and holler to yell at people to listen. I didn't commit this crime and I'll never say I did. It affects your mental health. It can make you hard, it can make you bitter. Prison is not designed for any type of humanity. My mother is beating and banging on every door. A friend of hers seen an article in the newspaper that said that they're gonna open an innocence project in Cincinnati. I just remember thinking, oh my God, somebody is gonna help me finally after all these years. Nearly 39 years since I walked out of that courtroom headed to death row, and anybody sat down in front of me and talked to me about what had happened to me. When the Innocence Project took my case, it was like a ton of weight was just lifted off of me because I knew that these people got people out of prison. A 59-year-old man who spent 23 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. I was mad. I was hurt. I know I didn't commit a crime. We are their last hope. Someone to advocate and believe in them and fight for them when no one else will. I was lucky enough to have a case where Evan got exonerated and that was just one of the most emotional and craziest times because I, I don't think anyone thought he was actually ever gonna get out because we got roadblocked time and time and time and time again. And 
he stayed hopeful and I don't know how. So it was just really awesome to see him finally, finally uh, get his voice heard. The Ohio Innocence Project is the most important thing I've really done in my legal career. It's a hard job. It's not all wins and celebrations. It's a lot of grind work. It's a lot of looking through records. These kids, they put a lot of effort to get to know you, to get to know your case. They don't hesitate to come up into the prison to see you. We try to help them understand what we're trying to do to help them get out. And as much as we can, we empathize with them. Those kids mean the world to me, you know, every one of them. What do you say? What, you, what can you say to a kid who just basically helped save your life? How do you thank them? I told Ms. Bergeron and the students, I say, I feel comfortable with y'all, and y'all gonna be the ones to get me out. And I told her, I see, I trust you. There's a saying in the legal field that you shouldn't get too close to your clients, that you should hold them at arm's length. And I just totally disagree with that. I would never give up the closeness and the personal relationships that I've had with so many of our clients. So that's the thing that's kept us fighting in these cases and kept our nose to the grindstone year after year. My first Thanksgiving as a free man was with him and his family. And uh, I'm extremely grateful for that gesture to open up your home to a guy that had been in prison for 39 years. You're just fighting a system that doesn't want to admit mistakes. You see these people who have been wrongfully convicted. In our office, we have to often just sort of pick each other up to keep going. It's knowing that you're, you're helping people that keeps the fight going, it makes you stay up night after night working on the briefs. They spend so much time in putting a case together and to show that you are innocent. They gave me hope for the first time. How many lawyers you know just continue to fight, 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 fight? And most lawyers don't do that. Most of them gave up and she just stood up to them and that's why I just admire her so much. When somebody do something with you for years, they become a part of you and they become a part of everything that y'all doing together. So y'all be joined. I was acquitted in 2009. December 22nd, 2011, the federal court released me and I was out for Christmas. It was a beautiful day. I knew that this day had come one day, but I knew I'd cry too, because my mother told me to never get up. It's a beautiful day, man. As an exoneree, the state isn't obligated to do anything for me. I'm exonerated. I'm released from custody. They have no obligations to me. Our Innocence Project was there for me all the way. They kept me off the streets. They helped me get my life back together. You know, I just knew one day that I, it was time for me to move on and that I needed to do things. I needed to make my own money. So I called Mark and I was like, do you think you guys could help me go through a dog grooming school? And he was like, well, you know, Nance, I don't know, but I can look into that for you. She was just talking this through as sort of a dream job, but going to do dog grooming school was expensive. It was beyond her means and it requires all kinds of equipment. So we were able to have a donor step forward and pay for her to go to dog grooming school and buy all her equipment. I've never looked back. I love this job and I love what I do. I'm grateful every day that OIP gave me the opportunity to be able to further my career. I have been asked to be on the board of the Ohio Innocence Project. I get out and I speak and I try to spread awareness about this cause because that's the only thing I can do. You've got me out, I'm not wasting this trip. I am going to push this issue as hard as you pushed it. Dean Gillespie, he's now one of my closest friends. I mean, we go fishing together, we talk on the phone, we help each other through personal crises, just like close friends do. And we're gonna be bound together, we're gonna be friends for life. We joined at the hip for life. Ms. Bergeron, I still call her up, you know, see how she's doing, how her family doing. The Ohio Innocent Project is family now. So that's what you do with family. Whenever someone's getting ready to get out, 
five or six of us will meet up. We'll go up to whatever courthouse it is, wherever they're going to be gotten out. I got to be at Ricky Jackson's exoneration. I got to watch a man walk out of prison after 39 years. It's a fraternity, man, you know, and it's healing for us to be around people that are like us. What helped me a lot is just having the right people around me. Me and Ruel talk often, Robert McClendon, Dean. These are people who've already been through what I'm going through now. It takes a village, no matter what you've been through in life. They're never not a part of your life. They're always going to be a part of your life, no matter what. I've looked over the abyss, gotten to the point where I didn't know if I was going to be able to live another day, but I always had that ember inside of me, that truth. I knew who I was. I wasn't going to let this circumstance define me. I wasn't going to be the criminal they labeled me to be. sleeping, I just heard him. Oh my God. Like, I ain't have no words. I was like, what, it really happened? Chris. I didn't even know you was down here, crying here too. Yeah, he's here. Just seeing my son. Fine. <laughs> See him as a man, as a husband, as a father, your grandson, like, Words can't even explain how much I look up to my son. Seeing Michelle, who's like my sister and someone who fought for me all these years, and just breathing that fresh air, it just hit me. It's time to get to work. So that video is a little old. Uh, it's from 2018, but I continue to use the video because it's the only thing that we have that introduces you to a lot of clients uh, at once. But it also proves a point. Um, at the end of that, or at some point, it showed 28 people, uh, 492 years. In the five years since then, another 12 people have come home. So more than two every year, and it's now 775 years. So it puts it in perspective uh, about the time that you'll be students here, uh, that many people have been coming home in Ohio. So think about that whenever you see one of these stories. And it's important to realize that a lot of the people in the video, although they appear older now, 
you have to think about their age when they went into prison. The youngest of any of our clients was 16 years old, tried as an adult, and spent the next 20 years in prison for a murder he didn't commit. And he was wrongfully convicted with two other young men, a 17-year-old and an 18-year-old. Uh, the youngest of them, Loris, had never been involved with the criminal system before. And one of the things that happen is that innocent people don't lawyer up when they get their Miranda rights because they don't think they need an attorney. So one of the things for all of you to take away from this is the Constitution gives you a right to an attorney for a reason. It doesn't make you a bad person or a guilty person to exercise your right to an attorney any more than it does for you to exercise your right to vote or to worship or to carry a gun. Those are rights that you're given and you have them for a reason. So don't think that you don't need a lawyer and don't think that it'll look bad. Law enforcement officers recognize what the Constitution is. And this isn't an us against them game. Everybody in the system can make a mistake for the fundamental reason that we're humans. We're flawed. Defense lawyers make mistakes. Innocence projects make mistakes. And so do prosecutors and law enforcement. The issue is, do we have the integrity to stand up and admit that we've made a mistake? And unfortunately, the answer isn't always yes. So today, we're going to talk about one person's experience with exactly this issue. So please help me uh, welcome up that one very special person. <laughs> Come on up, Michael. <laughs> so one of the reasons that I really wanted to have this event with Michael here um, is because he has a tie to the university. And we're going to talk about that now. Gil's going to ask some questions as we go along, too. And then we'll get to all of your questions. So please try to uh, keep them in mind. And we'll give you as much time as we can. Doing OK, Michael? Yep. And he's going to. Hello, everyone. My name is Joe Clay Hammond. And I'm currently the vice president of the Ohio Innocence Project. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming out, Michael's family and friends. And the biggest thanks goes to Michael and Pierce for coming out. And we'll get into it. Michael, help them understand what happened with you. So I want to take you back a few years. Uh, May 29th, 2006. How old were you then? Um, I, was, I was 18 on that night. It was my, it was my prom weekend. You know, we was about to. Plus, it was Memorial weekend. So like that night, May two, May 29, two thousand six. I was just about to graduate from high school. You know, it was my prom weekend. I was just, I was just going out celebrating. You know, like what kids do because Memorial weekend. That's the time when all the colleges let out, all the high schools let out. And, you know, I was just about to graduate high school in four days. I had a full ride to Akron University. So, you know, like, like it was just, it was supposed to be like a, just a, like a night of, of, of fun, you know? It was, it was me plus three more people in my car that night. Can, let's slow down a bit. Did you say, you had just got a full ride to the University of Akron? Yeah. So that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge deal. And I, I was supposed to go to school here back in 2006. <laughs> How does it feel to be here now? You know, just like the, 
this like my unwritten story, cause it's like I was supposed to go here, but it's like my first day in jail was supposed to have been like my first day in college. So you know, I used to try to treat prison like, I guess this is like the school of hard knocks. Sometimes I, I tried to just try trying to cope with certain stuff like, well, my first days of college was like my first days of prison. How long was your education in prison? Well, I did 15 years wrongfully in prison. So since 2006, May 29th, all the way to May 3rd, 2021. And you said you were 18. You had just turned 18, right? Yeah, I just turned 18. It was my it was my co-defendant, Kenny Phillips, right here. It was his birthday that night. We was just, you know, I was graduating high school. It was his birthday. We was just, you know, we was just kids just going out. Can you move Ken? just a little closer? Sure. Did you say something about Kenny Phillips? Yeah. Is Kenny Phillips here? Yeah, he in the second row. Kenny Phillips, would you stand up, please? <laughs> so Kenny knows this story well because he lived it, too. Um, you called it your prime weekend? Yeah, it was my prime weekend. And, you know, it started off as just a regular typical night, like we was going to the nightclub and we was just going to go celebrate, you know. While we was in the nightclub, it was like a typical night, you know, we just, we just danced, listened to the music, and by the time the club was over with, it was still like a regular night, you know. But like, on our way home, like we from Cleveland, Ohio, so we was like at, at the 55th marathon, like, in that area, you know, in that area, especially around that time, it's, it's a lot of gridlock traffic and it's a lot of cars. Plus at, at like two o'clock in Cleveland, that's when all the clubs let out. So when all the clubs and all the bars and everything let out, majority of the traffic has to come that way, you know, just for people to come home. So, that's usually, sometimes that could be like a meet-up spot for kids because you got, you got fast food spots around, plus you got a couple of gas stations and it's a, it's a crazy big intersection. So, you know, like back then, it was like a meet-up spot for real for like teens, you know, that got nice cars. Ooh, who had a nice car that night? Oh yeah, I had a nice car. <laughs> well, yeah. How nice was it? Don't be shy. Oh yeah, I had a real nice one. And I had a no, I, I had a I had an old school Chevy Caprice on twenty twos. I had thirty eight door speed. I had a crazy sound system. But, you know, like I had NASCAR stickers all on there. It was just it was like my I got it just for doing good at, at high school. You know, like my parents got it for me, like as a like a graduation gift. You know, because back then, you know, we, we used to like cars with rims on them, man. You know, this was like my first time driving it down there. I drove it to prom and later on, this was about to be Memorial Weekend. So this, everybody need to see this car, so. Did you thank anybody for that car? Huh? Did you thank anybody for that car? Oh, my mama. Is your mama yeah, here? My mama right there. Your mom, pick up on Hey, ma. <laughs> Who else is with you? I got my oldest sister with me, Lucretia. And I got my, one of my oldest nieces with me, Jay Marie. <laughs> She's so shy. Oh no, she perfect. Did you hear that? He said you're perfect. Thank you. In front of all these people. You go tell all your siblings. <laughs> all right, so who was in the car with you? We know Kenny. And then you had your friends, Akeem um, and Deonta? Yeah, it was, I was the driver. They labeled me the driver. They labeled my passenger, um, Deontay Creel who sat behind me was Kenny Phillips, and who sat behind Deontay Creel was Akeem Tidmore. So it was four of us in the car at the time. 
And as you're driving along with all these other cars in this congested area. Okay, well, well basically it was like, I was just at, I was at a red light, you know? Like, and it's, it's really like, we on our way home, like, there's no other way for us to go home. I'm at the red light and as the light turns green, it's like, it was already some cars already up ahead, but you know, I'm not, I'm not thinking nothing of it. I'm just about to drive and this is our route to go home. So I'm just, not too much long as I get on the street, I'm just driving down the street. Next thing I know, I just look up, the car in front of my car gets to shooting at the other car. First thing I, I remember I seen a, I just seen an arm just come out the window and just, a lot of shots just get to going off. And you just, you know, like, it was just like a lot of flash and muzzle I seen, just, just shots after shots after shots. And then the car pulled off. But the car probably was doing like, it, it, it just was going so fast, I pulled over. I see the police coming, like, I know the police is in the 55th Marathon because when I was at the red light, I seen two police cars over there, so. But I'm not thinking that they're about to think that I did this. You know, when the shots happened, I pulled over. That car took off, and then the police, I'm thinking, like, I see the police, they turned their sirens on. I'm thinking they about to go after that car. But they pulled me over. So just, just in that little, that little split second, it was just like, damn, it's us. And, and this ain't something like you could prepare for, like, you know, like, like I'm really just witnessing, I just seen two people get shot in the head. It's four people in this car. But I'm, I'm seeing, cause I'm driving behind this car. And as this car is shooting this car, it's like, I can't do nothing but slow up. Cause these two cars really got the street blocked off, you know? So it's like, you know, and then it's like, what do I do? Do I, I, I don't, you know, like I don't got the rules or the, I can't, I don't know what to do, you know, like, so it's like I'm panicking, you know, like, I'm thinking the police is gonna go after this car, not, not me, you feel me? And it was just like, as soon as I, I pulled over, it was like, it was, I don't know, it was like, I just, I ain't feel safe where I was at. I'm not, this not even my area or where I stay at or nothing. I just wanted to see like some, some street lights, some houses or something. So, when they pulled me over, it was like I was pulled over, but it was like I started driving. And then when I started driving, I just, I just needed to see some houses or something. And next thing I know, it's like we was being charged with all type of stuff. I got charged with shooting at the police that night. The police, the police said we got out the car with three guns. The police said we got out the car with three guns and got to shooting at the police. The police officer said he was running and chasing one of my co-defendants. He said he ran and chased him and fell in the ditch because we were shooting a gun at him. And I guess he so happened supposed to towards ACL and we got charged with attempted aggravated murder on the cop. So not to, not to mention, I'm charged with four counts of attempted murder because it's four people in this car. Even though two just got shot in the head, I'm about to get charged with everybody in this car. And not this, so I had a 21 count indictment when I was 18. I was charged with, I was charged with like six counts of attempted murder. I was charged with four counts of attempted murder just on the regular people. Then I was charged with two counts of attempted murder on police officers. Then we was charged with so many felonious assaults because them the under charges that go along with attempted murder charges. Not that long with the cops just lying and said that we were shooting at them. So now I got a whole nother charge of attempted aggravated murder. And then we got the resisting arrest, fleeing the loon there, failure to comply, you know, like, it's so many charges that get trumped up it's from one incident, you know, like. And you were charged, and Kenny was charged, and were Deontay and Akeem? 
We was all charged. And you go to trial. We went to trial. When we went to trial, it was like, it was four of us. And you know, we all like, when you big on your innocence, cause like, they could say like, when we first went to trial, it was like, it was, like, I'm gonna bag y'all up. Like when I first went to court, my first time ever going to court, we went to, we went to bond here in court. And it was this lady, she came up to me, she was like, cause when we came in there, we was, you know, we never been, in, we never been in trouble before, you know. We kids, we never even had a record. We go to, we go to high school. Like, you know, like, so it was like, our first day in court, we came straight out of, a, out the hole. You know, the hole is where, where they, like, solitary confinement. No shower, no nothing. So, you know, it's, I guess it's already was a picture getting painted because now it's our first time about to be on the news. And it's like, it's this something that we never knew nothing about. So, it's all experiences that we're just about to go through and it's about to hit us hard. So, our first time when we went to court, we had this judge named uh, Ms. Jas Ms. Jasmine uh, Lester. And it was like, they told me, they was like, the lady came up to me, she like, do you know your bond is a million dollars? And I, I seen the news and they're setting up, but I was thinking in my head, I'm like, dang, somebody in trouble, somebody did something. But I wasn't thinking they was in there for us though, like, you know, so I, I really was like, somebody did something, the news is in here. And then that lady, she's like, you know, you're buying a million dollars? Like, I'm like, a million dollars? I'm like, I'm like, we did not do this. I'm like, the car in front of us did this. Like, I'm like, no guns, no nothing was found in our car, no nothing. I, and it was like, this lady, she just, when she looked at us and, and she heard us, it was like the judge was calling us up, and since we was all like co-defendants, we four of us came up there to the stand. And the lady got to talking to the judge. She like, Your Honor, these guys said they ain't do it. That the car in front of them did, it. and I know where the bailiff comes from in the back. Like, Your Honor, Your Honor, this one of these guys' mothers on the phone saying that they son graduated from high school today. And that was my mother calling in while we was on TV. And, and the judge was like, who graduated from high school today? I'm like, I do. And then, she, and then there was a lot of questions. Got asked, she like, was there no guns found? They were like, no guns was found. They said the crime front. The judge was like, I believe y'all. And she dropped my bond from a million dollars to 1,500, 10%, 195. She told me, she said, it was, she said, I believe y'all, and for some reason, she said, I'm gonna let y'all go. She said, it's not a, she said, it's not enough black kids graduating in the black community. And she dropped my bond from a million dollars. She dropped Kenny bond from a million dollars to 20,000, 10%, 2,000. I guess they probably dropped mine so low because I was graduating from high school that day. But they dropped all our bonds though. So when I came home, all of us came home. But it was like, in that process of, of us getting our bond lowered that day, the prosecution and the judge got into it. And it was more so like, the prosecutor was mad that the judge was letting us go. And the judge and the prosecutor, they got into an argument in the courtroom. And the judge kicked the prosecutor out the courtroom on TV. So at the time, like, you know, we kids, we 17, 18, we ain't even been 18 for, for a month yet, you know, so we, we still kids. So it's like, we don't know nothing about the law. We don't know like that she kicking him out is gonna paint a bad picture on us, you know? So now we feel like it's judges out to target us. And, cause that's what it seems like, you know? But she kicked the prosecutor out the courtroom on TV and she let me go. She let, my mother came and picked us up. Kenny mother came and picked them up. I had to go graduate in like an hour. I went home, got my cap and gown. I went to the school and like, you know, the whole school was aware, but it's, for some reason, like my whole high school was downtown that day too. So before I even knew like the tell, I guess the news and already painted the picture, but 
you know, like when kids be together, it's like everybody knew like the police got it wrong, but it was just like we was up against a system that was just too big, you know, like sometimes right or wrong, like it don't stand up well when you gotta prove something. So it was like the same day they let me out to graduate, I was walking across the stage. And I got the third, the fourth, and the fifth district. All the police, so they came to my high school. They came to arrest me. So it was like, it was crazy. And the only reason they was coming to arrest me, they was coming to tell me that my bond got raised to 20,000, the same as my co-defendants, so I had to turn myself in. But you know, like, that was just part of the, beginning of the humiliation, you know, and the defamation of character, like. You eventually go to trial, all four of you, and yeah. the jury acquits Deontay and Akeem, but right. you and Kenny are found guilty. Right. You were sentenced to more than 46 years. Cool. So he gets sentenced to over 46 years. Kenny gets sentenced to 96 years. So basically, life sentence for one, and most of Michael's life. Deontay and Akeem are found not guilty. And you go to prison. Mm -hmm. Kenny goes to prison. And you all know that you have a right to appeal, but what you forget is how long an appeal takes. So you're arguing, protesting that you're innocent. And the first appeal goes up. And other than a small reduction in your sentence, nothing happens. Your conviction's affirmed. Right. I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> I do apologize for that. But yeah, um, <clears throat> so my first appeal my first appeal, when we went up, we won, we won part of our appeal, and then, we, and then half of it got denied. And you know, like, but we, we still didn't know nothing about the law when we first went in there. It took a lot of years for us to get to studying, but our first time when we went in there, we, we went in there on a sentence reduction. You know, we thought we was coming home, so. We, we, we was in prison in 2006. In 2011, I'm sorry, was my, first, was my first time back in court. So when I went back to court, I had 46 and a half years. And I had this attorney at the time named um, Paul Massino. My original trial judge was Peter Corrigan. He was the one like, that we was having trouble with. Like, he couldn't see the innocence from us. So we was, we was going in front of Peter Corrigan, but I had Paul Massino. And Paul Massino, he was, at the time, I was thinking like he, he a good attorney, you know? And like some of the attorneys that I did have, even if I did get denied and I had to get another attorney, I feel like they was good attorneys. It was just, they was up against, this was a huge task, you know? So my first time going up, my, my, my uh, Paul Massino, he asked me, he was like, I'm gonna look at similar cases. And at the time I had six years in, he was like, do you think you could take another two years? I was like, yeah, I, I could do another two years cause I'm already been locked up six at the time. And you know, like, ain't nobody never told me I could go home yet. So it's like, I don't even have them conversations because 46 and 92 years, like, you know, like, how can, you, how can you talk about it? Like, so I told my attorney, I'm like, yeah, I, I'll do another two years. Like, even if that meant 
saying that we was guilty, you know, it was, I just want to go home. So like, when we, when I, when I went in there, it was like my, the judge, he just, he reread them charges to us and he only took five years off. And at the time I was just thinking like, cause it was laws and stuff that I used to hear about, like about first time offenders. You can't max out a first time offender. And I just, I'm like, I ain't, don't we fall up under that criteria? You know, he took five years off of me. I swear when he, it was like, it was just like another, it was like I was resentenced again to the same death sentence. So I almost passed out in the courtroom. You know, and it was like, when Kenny went in there, I think he took 28 years off of Kenny. But Kenny got 92 and a half years. So it's like, what you, that, that's a favor, you know, like, we still don't come out, you know? And that was just in 2000, that was in 2011. So that was our first time going back to court. But you know, then our second time, it was just like, you know, over the years, once like, cause at the time, I would still have a regular attorneys represent me. Like anytime a lawyer could just hint at the, at the idea of me coming home, I don't care what amount they said it was, they, it was my family go pay for it. Cause my family right here and it's like, I'm my mom only son. I'm my father only son. You know, like, and I ain't wrong. And that'd be like the biggest thing. It'd be like, when you ain't wrong, you ain't wrong. Like, you could yell at me in the face and it might get hurt you, and, the, and it's, but I can't take that in though. Like, so it'd be kind of, it's kind of hard to accept, you know, like, like, I, like something that I did do when I didn't do it, you know, and, you know, they just, they could repeat it over and over and over. And, I ain't do it. You go, you go get the same result. To the last breath in me, like, we ain't do it. And sometimes they could, you know, like, with me, I feel like the courts could take, when you say you ain't do it, they could take that like, all right. Because they want you to, they look for the apologies for the sincere, you know. And it's like, to not get at, it's like you could be showing the courtroom disrespect you know, all them type of things kick in, like you making a mockery of the courtroom. So nine times out of 10, when you go to trial, they go and you lose the charges, your sentence go get trumped up. Like we got, we have, we don't even got a murder case. That's how we used to look at it. And we have more time than murderers, like real actual murderers. Like we locked up with people that killed two people and only probably got 20 years. And it's really crazy because it's like, it's like we just dead on our feet, you know? You hear stories about cops killing people, but then what about the ones that, like us, we got 136 years and we really just stuck in here due to police officers though, like no other way around. Well, let's get to that, Michael. But I just want to make sure everyone understands Nobody died in this, right? I mean, two guys were shot, but they both survived. They survived. Which doesn't make it okay, but it was attempted murder, not murder. Not murder. So eventually what happens after the appeals is that you and your attorneys get information by other people that saw this shooting unfold, right? And they come forward and say, it wasn't Michael in his car, it was a gold car in front of him. Same kind of car you saw. And you were trying to get a new trial. You weren't right. asking to be freed, you were asking for a new trial. And I want to present this evidence that says somebody's arm came out of a different car and shot the people who got shot. Yeah. And the judge denies that motion. Yeah. And then soon after that, Kenny's attorney Joanna Sanchez files a motion that's similar, except it's not just any old witnesses. 
It's police witnesses. Yeah. Two Cleveland police officers come forward and say, the officers who said they saw your car shoot the victims, those officers never could have seen that right. because they were back at that marathon station. Correct. And the judge also denies that motion. He denied it. So that gets appealed again, and the appeals court sends it back down to that same judge and says, you have to at least have a hearing on this, right? Yeah. And that takes another three or four years? <sighs> yeah, I rem yeah. It was like, it was like Peter Corgan was, he was like a judge is supposed to be a referee. Like, and that's how we, that's what we thought. But like our judge, like in the end it showed, like he never not once granted not one motion for us, not ever. Out our whole appeal processes, he never not once granted a motion in, the, in 15 years. And 13 years have gone by by this point. When we had, when, when the first police officer came forward, that was in the year 2015. So after we, after me and Kenny already had 10 years in prison, our first police officer came forward. And his name was um, Gregory, Jones. Gregory Jones. Gregory Jones came forward. Like we had, we, we were starting to hear information like it was a cop willing to come forward and he had a partner that was willing to come forward too. But at the time it was just like, you know, it was like we didn't, we ain't had the evidence yet. It was something that we was just hearing about coming from the attorneys. And like at the time, I was represented by the, like at the time when we was getting, when I was getting denied, Kenny was represented by the, the wrongful conviction project. So when Kenny first won his first motion, like I was denied. So I had to, I had to get with the Ohio Innocent Project. I had to write them a letter. And when I wrote them a letter, Kenny, Kenny attorneys told me that she was like, write the Innocent Project, and when you write them, I'm gonna catch them up to speed on everything that I got going on over here. So then when I wrote them, it was like the students from the Ohio Innocent Project went to see Ms. Joanna Sanchez from the Wrongful Conviction Project. And it was like when they met, they labeled us the first case in history that these two law firms was ever merged together as one. So it was like me and Kenny went from having just a lawyer to we got a whole staff of lawyers now. We got a, a team. We got a, a well run machine of lawyers now. And and they and they eager though, like, and it's students. And it's, you know, it's like like how they say, like our life in their hands. And it's just like I never feel comfortable with a, with a group of attorneys and students like, like the way these guys are like, like they turn into family. Eventually the appeals court orders the judge to have a hearing where all of this evidence can be presented. And keep in mind that it's not just any evidence. It's cool. testimony from police officers on duty at the scene who are coming forward to say other police officers couldn't have seen what basically puts Kenny and Michael into all of this jeopardy. It also comes out that the government knew that those two officers, at the time of the original investigation, had said that the state star witnesses, the officers who are identifying Kenny and Michael, knew that information, but had never been turned over to defense lawyers. And that's critically important 
You all know what Miranda warnings are. There's a case called Brady that's older than Miranda. It's not some new rule that got made up. And it's really simple. It just says that if the government's prosecuting you for a crime, but it has evidence that shows you're innocent of that crime, it has to turn it over to you and your lawyers. They can still use the evidence, it can still be admitted into court, but it's a fair play notion. It's part of your rights to a fair trial under the Constitution. The other thing that came out is that Kenny was the only person in the car the car that supposedly had fired all these shots at another car to test positive for gunshot residue. You were tested for gunshot residue, it's negative. Yeah. Deontay's tested, negative. Akeem's tested, negative. So they pin it on Kenny. But in this age of CSI and where you see all these testing and all that, it's never quite that simple. Gunshot residue can be really powerful evidence, and it can be accurate. But gunshot powder residue is like dust. It's very easily transmitted. So there are certain protocols that all good law enforcement follow. And one of the things you don't do is you don't put a suspect in a police cruiser to transport them, because police cruisers are filled with gunshot residue because law enforcement officers have to discharge their weapons. We want them to, we want them to be accurate. And there was a study done in California that says, if we take a bunch of people that we know have no gunshot residue in them, and we put them in the back seat of a cruiser, drive them around for half an hour, somewhere between one in three and one in four of those people coming out of the cruiser are gonna test positive. But the other side of it is the ingredients in gunshot powder include all kinds of elements, including iron. And this is also commonly found in common everyday things like the brakes on your car. So people who work on their cars, either professionally or just tinkering out at home, could test positive for gunshot residue, not because they ever had anything to do with the gun, but because they were handling their brakes. And this evidence comes out that even the one positive test, which was about Kenny, was not handled according to proper protocols. So it's all of this information now coming out years and years later that really should have been brought out at the original trial so that that jury could have had all of this evidence to weigh and then decide. And this is all Kenny and Michael are fighting for at this point, is a chance for a jury to hear the same evidence, but to hear all of the evidence. Yeah. And yet the judge still denies them a new trial. So they have to appeal again. The appeals court requires the hearing and eventually a new trial is granted. They're temporarily freed so that they can go forward with a new trial. How long ago was that new trial? Um, well, September 27, um, 2022. We just got found not guilty. So that was just a couple months ago. We just went through a retrial with the same with the same evidence basically that convicted us in, convicted us in the first place the same evidence that they used to convict us is like the same evidence was used to free us but when we was going through like our appeal process we had two cops come for it just out of nowhere and it was like these two cops had exculpatory evidence these two cops said that these other two cops that lied on us, they said these cops weren't where they was, where they said they was at. These cops said they, they, they shots was fired, they came out the marathon, and they pulled us over. But the, the new cops came for like, no, that ain't true. 
It's like we came out the marathon, y'all didn't come out. It's like we was the first ones on the scene. These cops that arrested us, they said that they seen us shooting, they seen us hanging out the window, and that we shot up this car and they chased us. We turned on the side street, we got to shooting at them. But the new cops was like, we ain't hear no shots. It's like this was a simple arrest. But at the time, these two cops are, they was the ones that was handling the police report. They controlled the whole narrative of the case. They wrote, they wrote, they did everything. Like, even when I just went back to trial, these two police officers was in the courtroom the whole trial, day for day, second for second, like. So, you know, my case was basically like, was majority to do with police misconduct. Like, police officers lied on us, they withheld evidence, and we used them against us. Like, we was charged with shooting at the police, but never not one time did the police radio shots fired at officers. But the only way that the evidence was credible against us in the beginning was because you had police officers coming there with a, with a suit on and they testified to it. So, you know, it's kind of hard to, to get under, get away from a police statement, you know, like, because, you know, they, they, they're sworn to protect. And they, you, you, you would look at it like they, they sworn to tell the truth. So, you know, that's, that's when I say, like, it, get, it, it got kind of, it got kind of real hard for us, like, for any appeal motion because people that shoot at cops, is like, you don't want to let them out. You don't even want to let them out on appeals. So it was like, that's the type of raw case that we had. It took for two police officers to come forward after 10 years and say that these cops lied on us. And then when they got to digging, it was like, okay, this cop said we shot at him. But he never said he seen a gun. He always said he seen the silhouette of a gun. So by this cop saying that we, he seen the silhouette of a gun, we was charged with the guns, even though he never not found one gun. He said when we got out the car, we had three guns. He never not, he made a mental note of where he seen the guns when he was chasing my co-defendants. Never not once did he find a gun though. Never not once did he file a shell casing. But at the same time, like, this, the cop that came forward said he'd been told the head detective the same night that we weren't shooting at him. But we never was disclosed those evidence. And that's where our unfair trial came in at, because when we went to trial, it was like, yeah, we had 21 counts, but we ain't had no defense. We, could, we ain't had no defense for nothing because the state never gave it to us. If the state would have turned over these what this officer said, my, my lawyers would have definitely put this police officer on the stand and questioned him about the other officer's credibility. So since that wasn't ever presented, that's where my Brady violation came in. Like, like my judge, Peter Corrigan, he, ain't, he still ain't grant this for me to come out. I had to, I had to go to the chief of justice to get Peter Corrigan removed off our case. So when we went to the Chief of Justice, I ended up getting a different judge because when they went to the Chief of Justice, they showed my judge record and he never not once did he rule anything in our favor. So it kind of looked it like, even when the police officers came forward, you denied them. You said that, that we know the police officers. I, I, I don't know these police officers at all, but that was just the, like in his statements, like when he was signing, while he would deny us, he was making ill competent statements. So, them were the type of results we was getting. We know the police officers and everything that these police officers saying, you don't want to believe nothing they're saying because it's like they're helping us out. But it's like, you would think that the law, like when you could prove something was done right, like that they supposed to go ahead on and do the right thing. But in my case, it was, it was more than that. To me, I feel like racism played a, a huge part in that. I feel like, cause it, a lot of perjury went on. And you know, like, 
just all that type of stuff. Like, what was my, my new judge I had to get? O'Donnell? Yeah, John P. O'Donnell, that was the judge who had released me from prison. Like this whole time we had Peter Corrigan, he ain't wanna he ain't wanna release us. It was like, I guess he already made his ruling when he gave us that time. And you know, like sometimes judges don't wanna be looking like a bad judge neither. Like, you know, sometimes judges feel like they are like the the they they so high. Who can question the judge? Because the judge could put you in jail. So I feel like we had a judge that that didn't want to go against their word that they already made because they made 130, how can you take back 136 years? So he got off of our case. And when he got off of our case, that was the first time where I really felt like a judge really understood it. The next judge that was signed up. I just needed any other judge because we had three judges in the Supreme Court gave us a Brady violation. But this same trial court judge is giving us a problem. Like, he like, no. We was we thinking we're supposed to get released one day, but if it's up to him, it's uh-uh, hold on. Anything he can do to stop it. There is a lot of information here, Michael, so I want to, um, Gil, do you have some questions you wanted to follow up before yeah, we get to the question. audience? Yeah. So the first question I have for you, Michael, is during the 15 years you're wrongfully in prison, you maintain a glimpse of hope in a place that's the furthest thing from hope. How did you do so? I did that with, like, with my family. I needed that family support. You know, it was like my mother. My mother always was just, she was right there. Like my first day when, when we went in prison, I remember that. You know, my mother slept in front of the Justice Center for three days with my entire family. And then it got to the point where my entire neighborhood coming down. And then it was like, it, it wasn't just one of me it's three more of us, so I got three brothers that I can lean on because we all going through the same pain. And then our mama's all going through the same pain, so, you know, we it's just like we built a community together. And, you know, like, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't easy, you know, like, because jail had have you questioning a lot of stuff, you know. You would be like, why me? And I used to always be like, why me? Like, jail, it, 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 it tests everything, especially being gone that long, like, and you can't see no light at the end of the tunnel. It'll have you testing your faith, your religion, like, it'll have you, it'll test your heart, like, jail can make you cold, but some, when you got that family, like, that help, because they gotta be your, they gotta be your voice while you in there, like, you know, like, when you go to prison, you ain't got no voice, you ain't heard no more. But I had to make my mama see, like, you got to be my voice. You got to do this, you got to do that. And only reason you got to do that, because you my mama, and, and that's off the mama love strength. You got to do that, because I, I need help, and you my mama. And they say, you better help your son if he needs some help. And my mama in trouble. I don't know. I ain't do it, though. And once I told her I ain't do it, she believed me. You know, I just knew like I in there, I used to be like, don't get in trouble. Cause it's still easy to get in trouble even while you're in prison, because it's like you could come through the door, you could look too strong, and you could just get a CO to like 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 prison get like like prison like it could be like another form of slavery, like, like you gotta get in line and it's gonna be a lot of you know like like, they could break you, like, but sometimes it's, you got strong people that don't want to get broke. And then you got some people that just do bad stuff in prison, too, though, like. But then you got, sometimes you got COs that just ain't used to people of our color, of our kind. And, you know, and it's like you could get a double end of the, of the sword, you know. But my family kept me strong, like, my family and just the visits, like, anything, like, 
from the outside world. Because in there you could get lost behind the walls. But just having that sense of hope from your family, like, that helped out a lot. My mama used to be like, uh, you better go pray to God. And I'd be like, Ma, I got all this time. God don't like me. I, I quit. I ain't believing in God no more. And my mama would be like, you better go pray to God again and just ask him for a way out. Now, I swear, one day I, I was in a hole in prison, and I just, I was just like, I don't know. It's just, I couldn't figure it out. Like, and I just prayed to God to find a way one day. The next thing I know, I, I got a cop. A cop wrote me a letter in the mail. And I was just like, uh-oh. <laughs> I called my mama like, my. When you told me, uh, ask God to find a way, I'm like, look, I'm like, this cop just wrote me a letter saying he's willing to come forward. But it was, it was my family, like, we all got family too, so if like, just say like, if we hung, if I'm hungry, Ma, you got $50? No, I ain't got it. I'm gonna call Kenny, Mama. You like, you got $50? I'm hungry. All right, she ain't got, I'm gonna call Deontay, Mama. Why you got 50, somebody got fifty dollars, and then they they sisters might just get tired of hearing me ask. They like, man, tell I got a hundred for him, and then like, all right, thank you. You all wanted me to call and ask that much, you know. But it, you know, like we all just had each other back, so that helped out. That helped out a lot. You got a good mama. <laughs> yeah, I got a great mama. So sure. <laughs> Kenny, Kenny mama too. It wasn't just my mama. She right there in the second row. That was our, that was our super Did you ever pay them back all those meals? Oh yeah, we working on it. We working <laughs> on it. Gil, what else do you have? Uh, my next question is, the, this occurrence of being wrongfully convicted caused you to have a different view on the criminal justice and law enforcement themselves, and if so, how? I mean, yeah, yeah. Cause you, yeah, I mean, I got PTSD from this. So you already got to think about it like, for, for us to go to jail, it was so easy for them to put us in jail, but it was so hard to get out. It, I'm talking about, it took, it took what, 17 years for us to finally get to clear our name. But like that was that that was hard, you know. And it's like I thought I thought like cause you you ever hear like when perjury come around like you hear people they go on stage and they lie in the courtroom. You hear about people getting a year in jail for perjury and stuff like that. And I knew like we all knew my entire family like oh here go this cop, he been lying on us the whole time. He didn't hear evidence. He in, my, he in the courtroom the whole time. He got on the stand. All of our attorneys questioned him, and they ripped him apart. And it was just like nothing he said that he testified to made sense. Even the police dispatch tape made him lie, like to the point where we got the truth, but you won't admit to it. This officer's still a cop. Like when, when I when I when I got found out guilty, I thought they was gonna put some handcuffs on him. He just smirked at us and walked out the courtroom. And he's still a head homicide detective in Cleveland, Ohio. So that scared me because even though he don't know where I stay at, it's like, I know I'm a part of his district. So I don't even, you feel me? Like, I don't even want no car in my name. And I got, I got a brand new car, but I don't even want it in my name because I'm scared if they read that tags, like, you know, like, they might be like, I got, you know, somebody, I, they could call me in. I got license and insurance, but it, it, it's scary, you feel me? It's like, it's, it's kind of hard to trust, you know? And, I, and now that I'm home, you know, I, in prison, I wasn't, I, when I left the streets, there wasn't no Instagram or Facebook. I think we had MySpace. <laughs> so now I, I watch Facebook all the time. And I see these police in the counters, you know, and I see it so much, but I'm just coming from that. 
you know, it, it get tricky. It, it gets, I, it gets scary. Like you know, like how can I put my trust back in something that just took my life? And I know they ain't no bad people. Like the cops that came and freed me. I like, like I wish I could could have just told them thank you a thousand times. But I felt like if I would have tried to say thank you, it would have been like some type of criminal law rule where I would have broken, but like, you gotta go back to jail, like, right. or something. Cause that's how I used to seem, like, it just, I used to, we just, you know, it's tricky. I, can, I know all cops ain't bad cops, but I don't know. I don't want them experience. I don't want to go through them no more. Go ahead. I have one more for you. Getting arrested so early in life, missing the prior years of your life, you said you guys are just all having fun like teens do. And now you get out, you miss those years of your life, and you can't get them back. So what do you look forward to most in the future? <laughs> I'm about to get to, I got a little daughter on the way. I got my first child on the way. I'm about to have a little girl. So. <laughs> Her name, her name, Legacy. So you know, it's like in jail, I can't, I can't have no kids. So I, I was so young when I left that I went, I wasn't able to make one. So now that I'm, you know, I got her. It's like that's my second win right there. I'm about to, she ain't gonna know what nothing feel like. So I'm about to kick it through her. And since you know, like I, I turned 35, they took all my 20s away. You no. Know? I'm about to get ready for the baby shark and all that stuff, you know. I'm ready for the Disney on ice. I ain't gonna lie, I'm, I'm ready. Yeah, the Barbie dolls, I'm ready to play house. You know, I'm ready for them steps. You know, fashion shows, we gonna do it, we gonna do it big. Mickey, so that, I feel like I'm a, you know, I lost a lot. And at the same time too, like, I guess I, I don't know, after all these years, I gained a lot too because I lost so much and the stuff that I do got right now is like, that's what I'm supposed to have. So I don't, try, I don't try to worry about the stuff that I can't control or the stuff that I don't got because like, we can get caught up in that, you know, like doing all this time. When I left, I had a full ride to college. I had this, I had that, but I'd be like, when I come home, they release us to nothing. I don't got a house, I don't even got a bed. I don't, you know, it's like everything that's about to, that we about to get is about to be given to us. So, I, I just feel like, you know, you just gotta play the big adjustments because I had to come home from, from us going in there 17, 18 to 34, 35, and that mean that you gotta grow up quick because it's like, you're 34, 35. You can't be 17 and in your 30s. You feel me? So it's like, you crippled, but somebody like me, it's like you gotta hold it together. And you gotta, so I, it was just more like, just don't worry about all that. Just adjust and just, but adjust the right way. Adjust your way, adapt and all that. Like, and that's, that was huge because like I said, just working an iPhone was so hard. My family, like, you should have got an Android. And then I was like, <laughs> oh, really? You feel me? So it's like, you, we had to learn the internet. You know, it's like, I had to come and get around my nieces and nephews just to learn the simple stuff, because they kids. So what do kids do? And I had to learn from them. And they taught me so much stuff. All the apps and everything that I needed, the computer stuff, like, you know, like, I, I play catch up through my family. And I just wanted to just kick it with, and have fun with them. So I try, I don't know. I try not to worry about that. When's your baby coming? Oh uh, yeah, my baby will be born May 25th, Memorial Weekend. Wow. <laughs> I can't even take it back. So it's like, that was like my, that was, yeah, and it's Kenny Twin, his birthday too. So it's like, it was his, 
May is May is a huge month for us. It's Kenny birthday, my daughter's birthday. We was released in May. We got locked up in May. Yeah, let's keep this one calm this year. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try to top your other Mays. Um, yeah. We're almost out of time. Um, Kenny, why don't you come up? Say hi to people. <clears throat> Kenny, did you bring somebody with you? My queen, my mother. Well, could the <laughs> queen come up too, please? Come on. So, man. Michael, you're gonna let Kenny bring his mom up here? Yeah. And you're not? Come on, Ma. Please. Wow. Please. Sorry, please. Come on, Ma. So, Ma. What about your sister? Damn. Oh, come on, whole family. Come on, y'all. I was hoping. <laughs> he said whole family. Come on, Jay. A little nervous. So again, go back to whenever you see statistics and numbers, don't think about statistics and numbers. Think about these amazing people and just think how much you learned today and that these are two people out of those 3,388 and everybody has a story. So take the time to try and understand these stories I mean, look at the, they're not just <laughs> what they've been through. They're beautiful people. I saw you that twirl. You can do <laughs> So thank you to all of you. It really means a lot that you show up to do things like this. And all of us appreciate you making the time today. Thank you. Thank you. Trying to hold together. Oh, considering that you are <laughs> <laughs> Man, damn, thank you. Oh yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Huh? Oh yeah. Cause I, I would have helped out the football team, I'm telling you. I would have helped out.